the ideal segue, Jason, to our discussion that we were having in Vegas in that Mexican restaurant at the Venetian or wherever <laughs> uh, on this distinction, this weird, this oddity where it seems as though some of the most successful winners in the NBA have a sport they love more than basketball, which is a bit of a paradox that Michael Jordan appeared to love baseball more than basketball and golf more than basketball. And Steph Curry loves golf more than basketball. Somebody would say, how can you possibly know that? And I would say, whenever we were in the locker room, we looked at his TV, it was on the golf channel. He wasn't looking at NBA TV. He was obsessing over golf. And sometimes the great hoopers, guys who really sing the gospel of loving basketball, aren't necessarily known as being the most competitive guys. Kevin Durant, he's won championships. He is a hooper's hooper, but I don't think people think that about him. And then it's not just KD. There's Jamal Crawford. You can tell Jamal Crawford loves basketball, but he's not hes not up there with, hey, you need that guy in order to win a championship on your team. So what is going on with this? What is this distinction between having what it takes to win and love of the game? I think it's important to upfront express that we are splitting hairs between all time greats in the NBA. So like yeah. to we're comparing differences between KD and Steph and LeBron and other guys like that. And it stems from this basic idea, which is I think KD was probably the most naturally gifted basketball player ever uh, before women Yama. Like when you actually think mobility, coordination and size, like maybe LeBron, there's a handful of guys before him, but like at his height to be as, and it, just go watch highlights of KD before he hurt his Achilles. The dude was crazy mobile side to side, could get to his spot like crazy and never made an all defense team. Never really like got to that level as a defender that we knew he was capable of. And uh, I, I think this was actually one of the things I overheard you say at the table at dinner the other day. Ah but I think you had mentioned something about how KD like should have been the goat or like he had that potential. Mm. And this is something that I've thought for a while, which is that like, you know, like there was another level that KD could have gotten to in terms of dominance in the league. If he was a little nastier. And what I mean by that is like, I think the game of basketball is beautiful, but there's beautiful elements to it. But most big basketball games are actually ugly. They're actually nasty. They're like that game seven in 2016. It's 89 to 89 with a couple of, with, yeah. with like a minute left. Most of them are nasty. Most of them are ugly. When I think back to all of the biggest basketball games that I've played in, almost all of them are fistfights. And that really to me is the, is the main differentiating factor here, which is a person who loves basketball can go into a gym by themselves or with a rebounder and can work on their game and be utterly at peace and shoot pull up jump shots going right and left over and over again and just kind of be in the mix of it. But the truth of the matter is, is like, if you want to beat the nuggets on Saturday, you got to get nasty. <laughs> you like, you got to get nasty. You've got to, you've got to uh, box out Aaron Gordon after you were just offering help on Nikola Jokic. You've got to sprint down the floor and transition every single time to make sure you don't lose KCP or Michael Porter Jr. There's like these physical battles that you have to win. And the last example I'll use before I kick it back to you is I remember when I was watching Nick's heat last year uh, before game six, I was watching RJ Barrett doing kind of like a shooting workout uh, before the game. And he hit five threes in a row out of the left corner. And he kind of like clapped his hands. And he was like ready to go. And I remember thinking before the game, I was like, I was like, this game's not going to come down to whether or not RJ Barrett can hit threes. Like mm -hmm. he has a hundred physical battles tonight, whether that's keeping up with the transition you know, back and forth, whether that's keeping his man in front, fighting over the top of a screen, fighting for contested rebounds, fighting for position here, fighting for position there. It's actually the hundred physical battles that he has to win tonight that are going to matter for the Knicks, not whether or not he can knock down two of four threes instead of one of four threes out of that left corner. And so that to me is like, what motivates you to win those battles? Probably not the same thing that motivates you to go be peaceful in the gym shooting around. It's a hatred of losing. And mm. at dinner, you referred to it as a love of winning, but I think we're both getting at the same thing, yeah. which is basically that that is a separate concept 
than my love of the game. Loving basketball is separate from hating losing. And, and I think there's a scar tissue that forms when you lose. And I think the best of the, uh, the greatest of all time kind of pick up that scar tissue early and it makes them terrified of it. And it makes them make efforts that they otherwise wouldn't make because their greatest fear is losing that game. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And to avoid humiliation. So Anthony Edwards, when he came out, people were really worried about him as a prospect because he actually said that football is my favorite sport. He was openly saying that basketball is not my favorite sport. And I thought maybe at the time that that was an issue, but now looking back, no, that's good. That's really good. It's uh good because of what we were talking about uh, that for whatever reason, some of these winners have that, but also what you're talking about that you want the nasty, you want the brutal, you want somebody who's into a bit of physical competition. And we don't know if he's going to end his career as a great winner, but I would say that he has been above expectations and it has served him well, because there's something strange going on when it comes to these games that really matter. It does become something that's like basketball, but not quite. It's something more where it's the XFL. It's the one of those old XF, <laughs> uh, XFL kickoffs where they just put the ball in the middle and they got two guys running. Somebody's got to grab it. Something like that happens. I don't know why it goes that way, but it's it ceases to just become a competition of skill and become something else. There's a level of intensity too, and I've noticed this. I don't get it very often anymore, but it was a lot when I was playing where... When you're in a uh, when you're in a really physical game, there's like a natural response from your body that's like a it's almost like a you enter into fight mode. <laughs> like it's hard mm. to describe. It's almost like a it's like a fight or flight response, some sort of like physiological response where you kind of get jittery. And what I mean by that oh, yeah. is like you're like geared up to fight. You know what I mean? Like there's a physical there's a very physical element to it. And in those situations, it's really hard to calm down and rely on muscle memory. And so this is one of my big theories for why like we see these games where it's like fourth quarter, 80 to 80 with, you know, seven minutes left and no one can hit a jumper. Like, and, and there's yeah. always like, there's always like one or two guys on the floor that for some reason can like, that's the crazy thing. Like if you look at that 2016 game, the game seven between the Warriors and Cavs, it's like Steph had a miss where he missed the rim to the left and almost put a hole in the backboard. I think it was the yeah. one that he took over Kevin Dur uh, Kevin Love, right? Yeah. And like LeBron had a couple of bad missed jump shots in that stretch. LeBron like missed a hook shot. Like it was right at the rim and he left it like a foot short. It's kind of crazy that Kyrie was able to get to an incredibly difficult jump shot and make it the way he did. Because in those situations, there's a reason why everybody's jump shot goes to hell in a handbasket. And it, a big part of it is like, physiologically you're so geared up for the fight that it's like just really difficult to rely on muscle memory in those situations, which kind of carries me to the, to the crux of this, which is like, let's take a look at LeBron. For instance, LeBron regularly gets made fun of for not having a bag. You know what I mean? For not having mm -hmm. the, 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 the polish that some of his peers have famously, he was doing that dribbling drill for USA. And then everyone was comparing him to Kendrick Perkins. Remember? Like that was the thing. So like LeBron has this reputation, but like LeBron is built for these physical confrontations and always ends up being one of the best players in those specific situations, which kind of like tells you who would you rather have a guy like, let's say Paul George, who has all of this polish in the world, or a guy like Paolo Boncaro, who's big and strong mm. and can like win fist fights in and around that short range area around the basket. And that's the thing. Like Paul George is way more skilled than Paolo, but Paolo, uh, but Paul just had a six game series against Dallas as the number one option and couldn't get to 20 points a game and couldn't get to five assists per game. Whereas Paolo kind of had these moments and averaged 27. And so that's, what's interesting is like, he did it because he's bigger and stronger than everybody and he can thrive in those fights. And so that to me is the fascinating part of it is it's the, it's the physical confrontation of basketball.